giving thanks always for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to God and the Father, being subject one to another in the fear of Christ. Well, Son, Holy Ghost, Amen. Okay. Uh, one or two preliminary notes today. First, from the Gospel, from the 20th Sunday. See, this man had faith. He had great faith. Uh, he traveled quite some distance in order to get to our Lord to ask him this favor. It would have been even better, however, if he really knew who Christ was. From where he was, he could have simply prayed and asked him. I mean, in a way, it may have shown more humility and, and more effort to go all that way to see him. Okay, but we know that if we need healing uh, for someone maybe who is sick uh, at the point of death, of course we have anointing, uh, the, the extreme unction, which can bring back uh, physical life and not just uh, you know, forgive sins. Okay, but also through prayer, I mean, we. We know that we don't actually need to be directly in the presence of our Lord to be able to ask Him for anything that we need. So there's a little bit of a lesson there for us in that. Of course, the man's, again, the man's faith was, was very great, and it's through his faith that our Lord healed uh, his son. So uh, with that, and at the very hour, at the very moment, you know, which Christ said it's done, right? So... Okay, so that's one thing. Today is also the feast of St. Luke, evangelist and physician, patron of physicians. It is widely believed, but not proven. Necessarily, there is, there are some who believe this and some who are not sure. But the gospel chosen for today, uh, for St. Luke, is one uh, where we have the, the 72, the mission of the 72 to go out to different houses and preach the gospel. It is said that St. Luke was one of them. And that, uh, so he knew our Lord directly. Whether or not this is true, we know from tradition that St. Luke knew Our Lady. In fact, you know, even though St. John was the beloved disciple, he was especially favored, and he was the one giving care of Our Lady after the crucifixion, it was St. Luke who in a special way was favored by Mother Mary because um, it was she who gave to him a number of the details of his gospel, especially towards the beginning and at the end. Towards the beginning, if you look at, his, for instance, St. Matthew's gospel, you have the genealogy, then you have the epiphany. Wait a minute, what happened in between, right? And the other gospel, St. John, of course, he's speaking, and we, we read the beginning of his gospel in the, uh, uh, at the end of the, of the Mass. doesn't really have much about the Holy Nativity there. St. Mark's gospel is the shortest, but St. Luke gets into the details. Um, in the case of the, the end of the gospel, we see that uh, the, the good thief, we talked about this before, where Our Lady obtained his conversion, because this was the thief who was a boy at the time in which uh, he was among a band of thieves, when Our Lady, of course, St. Joseph and uh, Christ child also, are, this was part of the flight into Egypt, and they met these bandits, and it was uh, Dismas who had said to uh, the others, do not harm this family, do not steal from this family. Uh, what I've heard is actually part of his practice to be merciful towards those who are especially maybe in need or especially dignified, uh, but maybe especially the Holy Family. And then, of course, Our Lady obtained for him, recognizing him on the cross because he did not change his life as a result of this, unfortunately, but it's still Our Lady did obtain his conversion at the end. And that's why we have this sort of the good thief. And that's the one that's in St. Luke that Our Lady gave to him. To, to, to give to the world. Um, also, with St. Luke, um, one other characteristic in his gospel is that he's very favorable to women, the dignity of women, uh, more than any of the other gospels. I mean, St. John, in a particular way, also does with the uh, woman caught in adultery and how our Lord uh, 
treated her, and then also, of course, uh, one or two other times there, the woman at the well. But St. Luke, in a particular way throughout his gospel, shows how uh, much our Lord loved the women who were uh, serving him, who were waiting on him. And it was, at the time, remember, among the Jews, they almost held the woman in a similar way to the Muslims, the way the Muslims do. Okay? And very much as property, very much as second-class human beings, and not equal in dignity. And St. Luke is one of those who would uh, work against that through his gospel. Uh, even, the, even the apostles at times had to be corrected for this. They were shocked in St. John's Gospel, the woman, well, how, you know, how familiar our Lord was being, at least in conversing with a woman who's not even Jew, a Samaritan. So that was a double scandal for them. So, but in St. Luke's Gospel, also very similar type deals where, or, or instances, I should say, in which um, it is clear that uh, women were to be honored um, with their dignity, even though there were certain inequalities between men and women, uh, that uh, the women were definitely equal in dignity. So, all right. So that was St. Luke. Now, I quoted from the verse in the epistle today because something here that might strike us at first glance. Being subject one another, one to another, in the fear of Christ. We've spoken much in the past about the subjection of inferiors to superiors. You know, the, the inferior is not in dignity, but the inferior in terms of vocation or, or in terms of the place, maybe like for instance, uh, maybe the wife and the children to the husband and father, uh, or maybe a priest to the bishop or the pope. Uh, normally, what was, what was supposed to exist, right? Uh, or employees to employers. Uh, so we have there where there's definitely a distinction in positions that is uh, good, that is a part of any healthy society. God wills distinctions. He wills differences. He doesn't make everybody completely equal in every way. Okay. Not egalitarian that way. Um, but it's also true that even those who are superior are at times meant to make themselves in a way inferior. And again, we've mentioned this before in one or two uh, sermons. Just the fact that one who's superior sometimes has to listen to the one who otherwise he is not bound to listen to, or she is not bound to listen to, but what is coming from their mouth comes from the mouth of God. And in humility, recognizing this, must act upon that word is coming from God, even though it's coming from one normally you don't obey or say. Okay. So if we take this too far, we get the Novus Ordo. We get this, I mean, practically complete equality you know, between a husband and wife, co-equal in the house, and John Paul II in uh, Dignitatus. Uh, uh, Lirium, I think it was. Uh, try to, not quite remembering exactly, but the dignity of a woman, not remembering exactly in the Latin, but that's just what it was. So, and then other documents which clearly try to put the two on equal par in, in the home, and other examples of this in which now more and more, not just the wife is equal to the husband, but the children are supposed to equal even to be treated greater than at times than the parents. They are to be, in a way, their own authority. Now, this started many years ago when girls who were pregnant didn't even have to let their parents know they were pregnant because they had the right, according to the state, to have an abortion, right? So we're not even talking about a parental consent, a parental notification. The, the, the child had the complete right over their body, right, or her body which of course is not just her body, as we know. There's another that she's responsible for. Uh, but this is denigrated even more now to a point in which we see that uh, uh, children, if, they, if a boy no longer wants to be a boy, oh, sure, he can become a girl. Doesn't need his parents permission for that, right? A uh, girl wants to be a boy, sure. If they don't want to be either, want to be something else, sure, cute, or whatever it is, right? So it's complete upside down reality, which is an imaginary world. It's nothing, has nothing to do with reality, 
is obviously taking this mutual subjection too far. Um, also, it is a part of the communist mentality to eradicate all personality to get us to the point in which there is nothing special about anyone. There's nothing dignified personally about this one or that one. Everyone is a creature of the state. Spoke a little bit in the beginning about the, um, the fact that you know the time at this time we talks about talking about St. Luke and the, the the raising of the dignity of woman, because otherwise they're treated very much as property. Well, now the state sees men, women, and children all as property. And that's what the whole point of the mask is, right? That, that we are uh, subservient to the state. We are creatures of the state. And we have a pers personality of ourselves. And, and what happens is, if you take away a person's personality, you take away their will. And if you take away their will, they'll do anything that you want. Right? So that's what's happening right now. And that's why it's so scary that so many are going along because they're already defeated. Right? Um, and again, there are certain instances where technically might have to comply, like a priest has to go to a hospital and anoint somebody if they'll even let you in. You know, sometimes you, you might just have to go along, otherwise they won't let you anoint the person. Of course, then you have to. We've talked about this before. And other times, in terms of work, that you might, you might just have to, for now, um, comply. But any, in every way in which you, you, you um, can resist, you do. Okay, so it's a thing that we have to continue to, to repeat because things are not getting better. Okay. Living in reality, as we are attempting to do, accepting that there are indeed superiors and inferiors in every healthy society. Now, being subject one to another does in some way refer to superiors in relation to inferiors and not just vice versa. Okay? And there are times in which, in the history of the church, where superiors have had to even relinquish some of their authority to keep the convent or the monastery together. One example of this would be St. Teresa of Avila, who you see recounted, if you've ever seen that uh, eight-hour uh, story about her, uh, well, plus 20, 30 years ago, whatever it was, um, where at some point, it was St. Peter Alcantara who had to break down the door, basically, because they didn't want St. Teresa to be their superior, right? So eventually, he breaks down the door, uh, this great humble saint, uh, Saint Peter of you can see just how furious he was about this, about what was going on. And Teresa of takes her place, crook and all, right? And she says, Our Lady will be the superior of this convent. Right? So she, in a way, in some way, relinquished her rightful place to save that community. And then over time, they became better and better until she had you know, more authority again that she was able to exercise. They gained more respect for her. Uh, um, and she had to humble herself in a way that she was not required to do, uh, strictly speaking. And yet in submitting herself to the others, unlike, um, who was it, uh, uh, Francis, when he was elected, his dubious election that he had, he just, uh, um, he bows down before the people like to receive their blessing, right? That's not what we're talking about. That's a false humility. This, in contradistinction to this, St. Teresa of Avila had true humility, and she was working for the salvation of souls. She had to, to, to mortify herself in order to save her convent. Uh, whereas uh, this man was doing nothing like that. Uh, he was subjecting himself in such a way as to lose all respect of the people, right? So completely the opposite. Now, St. Paul would be another example of this. And I was just reading this past week in St. Alphonse de Gori's Dignity and Duties of the Priest, quoting St. Jerome, writing of St. Paul, states, As the shadow follows him who flies from it, and flies from him who pursues it. So glory follows them who fly from it, and flies from them who seek it. And this is how St. Paul ruled, not with an iron rod, but with authority without imposition, all things to all men. Right? And through chains, through stripes, imprisonments, 
not by crowns and dignities. Okay? So he was a true uh, imitator of our Lord okay, on, on the cross. So like St. Paul, the priest is a spiritual father, also must practice humility in part in the exercise of his ministry, or his student. <laughs> Since my move from Orange County over a year ago, I have found abundant opportunities uh, to apply this virtue to varying degrees of success. I am the spiritual head of the parishes in my care. The buck stops with me. Sometimes there is no discussion. At other times, as has often been the case, however, this does not mean that I cannot submit myself to valid observations and judgments of those who see something that maybe that I miss. Right? It is not a sign of weakness or being controlled by the laity or of admitting an authority over me that does not exist. Okay? The point of this subjection is to set an example for the flock to acquire graces for parishioners to help them in turn to subject themselves to the will of God in all things. Some don't want that though, right? So it does happen where oftentimes, no matter what you do, if you humble yourself for the laity, you're weak. If you lay down the law, you're being transient, you're being too strong, right? So no matter what you do, whatever position of authority you have, you're going to be despised by some. <laughs> you can be absolutely right every time, which is normally not the case, but even if you are, you are not always going to be respected. However, one way not to be respected is to fail to exercise your authority with humility. If you do exercise your authority in, in a good way, then little by little, even those who are most rebellious, really deep down want to be ruled. They, they, this is in their nature, even if they're rebelling against that, sooner or later, the grace of God will bring through. But if you don't exercise your authority properly, you'll be despised, no matter what you do, and then the whole king of will be lost. So the mutual subjection, in a way, the, uh, the leader, the, the priest, or the father, or whomever, um, uh, to the people at times, and the people by nature to their leader, is something that uh, is part and parcel to the very, what bears witness to the fact that all of us are going to be judged. All of us, no matter how great or how small, are going to receive judgment equally. Okay. There was a story, maybe Elizabeth of Bavaria, I don't know if it was CC, as she's called, or not. I don't remember exactly who it was, but I remember the story pretty well. After she had died, she's the empress okay, of Austria-Hungary. And she's, her body is outside the church doors, and then the bishop or the priest, whoever, probably a bishop, would have had her funeral, asked who desires to enter, and then somebody answers on the Empress's behalf, I am, and we'll just say Elizabeth, uh, Empress of uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and no answer. <laughs> the priest asks again, and then the answer is some other dignity that she had, some other worldly honor or power that she had, no answer. Third time, no answer. A fourth time, I believe it was, third or fourth time, I think it was the fourth time, eventually, the answer came back, I am Elizabeth, poor, miserable sinner, worm of the earth, desperately in need of God's mercy, or something of that nature. The doors open, bodies let it, and the funeral happens. So it doesn't matter what thing, the, the, the popes, bishops, priests, in this life we are over you, but at death we are all made equal. <laughs> so, this mutual subjection now, in a way, humility is so even more important for those who rule because of the greater account that we will have to give to God of our quote unquote stewardship, right? So, be that as it may, it is also important for us to remember that given that we are going to die one day, that if we submit to uh, proper judgments of those whether it be above us, or even below us, especially below us, because it takes more humility then, we prepare ourselves for death. Because if we are submitting ourselves to the judgment of God each day, in all situations, no matter where it comes from or who it comes from, 
then what will happen is when God touches us directly with his finger and gives us some kind of malady or some kind of cancer or whatever it is that's going to lead to our death, we will more likely submit to it. But if we've been rebelling against those above us and those below us, then we will, in fact, rebel against God. Even no matter how many prayers we say or how holy we think we may be or becoming, if we are proud, we will not submit to the ultimate test of um, a martyrdom of sorts in our purification before we die. So very important that uh, we don't realize just how connected every decision is that, that, that we make is to our last end. We always pray every Hail Mary uh, for uh, our Lady's intercession now and at the hour of our death. And we pray in our Father to be delivered from the final test, right? In, in, in yet, right? So both of the prayers, the most popular, most important prayers we offer outside of the Mass, and our Father is actually in the Mass, um, have in them the prayer really for perseverance, right? And part of that perseverance is the mutual subjection in the fear of Christ, recognizing even the littlest person, the fact that God, our Lord, may be speaking through them. And that uh, our, we show our love, our obedience to him. And it will cause a purification. Okay? Because it goes against the grain of our wounded nature. Okay. So, let us finally... Follow the example of the physician, St. Luke, who put himself in the hands of the divine physician in every circumstance. And obeying divine providence became the friend and beneficiary of Our Lady, our Blessed Mother. We may not, like St. Luke, write our own gospel, but we will write our own chapter in history at a time in which so many bad chapters are being written. We have to write good chapters at a time which is more than ever necessary for such to be done, to obtain the conversion of many souls, many good thieves waiting for that moment of divine grace and faith. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.